about a month or a month and a half ago maybe, I posted a video on my channel saying that uh, here were five books I would be interested in reading, and um, let me know if anyone wanted to read one. Well, I got one response, um, which was uh, one more than I was honestly expecting, um, from uh, a very good friend of mine who uh, messaged me on Facebook one day and told me that he really liked my reviews. And uh, for that, I've been eternally grateful for all the encouragement and appreciation he's shown since then. His name is Ni Hao, and this book and this book review were for him. Um, he suggested of those five books that I held up that he wanted me to read this one. Um, it's called The First Moderns by uh, William R. Everdale. Um, books of intellectual history like this with this size and this scope, and I'll talk about both of those, are always difficult to talk about. Um, I've read some that were abysmal failures and others that were highly successful. Um, if I had to place this one along a spectrum, it's certainly close to the latter, uh, that is the highly successful, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, first, a point which has nothing to do with the quality of the book itself, but that I admire nonetheless, and that is that it's written not by an academic with narrow scholarly interests, but a wonderfully eclectic generalist by the name of William Everdale, who has taught in the Humanities Department at St. Saint, Saint Anne's School, which is actually a private high school, um, in Brooklyn, in New York, for the last 40 years. There's something about the um, approach of the passionate amateur, and as opposed to the the cloistered academic that always sort of gets me excited about ideas. The, 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 I, the knowledge that there are actually eclectic generalists out there is uh, pretty exciting. I don't think we have enough of them. Um, the First Moderns is good not only for what it covers just as well as other related books of intellectual history, but also because it covers a lot of relatively new territory too. Uh, we know the usual suspects we find in these kinds of books, right? Einstein, uh, Rimbaud, Whitman, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, Kandinsky, Schoenberg, uh, Strindberg, uh, Picasso, and several dozen other names we all are pretty familiar with. Uh, the names of Edwin Porter, uh, Santiago Ramon y Cajal, and Valeriano Weiler, however, uh, usually don't make it into books of this kind. I wonder if people even recognize these names anymore, quite frankly. Everdale also widens the scope of the book by covering not only names, but topics that usually don't get mentioned either. Uh, we're used to hearing modernism defined in terms of music, philosophy, and the visual arts. That's all very uh, banal, almost. Very rarely do we see uh, subjects like mathematics and science discussed, let alone the invention of the concentration camp, but we, which we actually get an entire chapter uh, devoted to that topic. Uh, the theme into which Everdale successfully manages to fit most of his vignettes is that of discreteness, uh, that is continuity versus discontinuity. Uh, one doesn't ordinarily think of something like mathematics as being potentially modernist, but there's a discussion in the book of Georg Cantor, uh, Richard Dedekind, and Gottlieb Frege uh, that really uh, sort of brings into focus exactly what he's talking about, about this discontinuity-continuity distinction. These three mathematicians uh, explore topics like infinity, uh, actually infinities, uh, because infinity itself has uh, different degrees, so to speak. Not, not a technical word, but um, uh, they explored infinity, set theory, um, and theoretical fundamentals of the field of mathematics, including questions like, what is an integer? Which uh, sounds like an easy question to answer, but uh, actually baffled uh, mathematic, ma mathematicians and logicians for centuries. All of this work uh, blurred the traditional lines of continuity and discontinuity 
that earlier logic and mathematics had felt so comfortable with and so confident in. We also get a wonderful and highly intelligent, even though non-technical, uh, account of uh, Ludwig Boltzmann's work with statistical mechanics and his defense of atomism. Of course, now we've uh, moved from math and logic to physics. Um, if matter is made of atoms, millions or billions or trillions of atoms, how do we discover anything about a concept as abstract as energy or entropy? Uh, Everdale details the ways in which Boltzmann invented new mathematical tools to think about energy and entropy as statistical averages of extremely complex states. The work of Boltzmann and the people after him showed how, when multiplied by trillions and trillions, tiny individual discrete atoms can have properties on mass like temperature, energy, or entropy, which in fact are, are all related to one another. They measure the, the disorder of uh, a material. Again, we see how the information about discontinuous atoms can in fact yield useful information about matter when thought of as, as continuous, as a continuous entity. And even when we get lessons from art history or music or poetry, those uh, more familiar uh, territories, um, Everdale always adds new contexts and, and new names and new layers that enable each chapter in the book to potentially morph into a book of its very own. And sometimes I found myself reading a chapter, you know, I, I wish this part would have been longer, and almost all of them could have been. He gives a beautiful account of uh, Surratt's invention and exploration of pointillism, uh, the invention, quote-unquote, of blank verse, uh, which is a chapter devoted to uh, Whitman, Rimbaud, and Jules Laforge, and a whole chapter on uh, Hugo de Vries' discovery of the gene and uh, Max Planck's introduction of quantum theory. Uh, books like this, in their inexhaustible attempt to explain what a concept like modernism might mean to wide swaths of human experience and creativity, can inevitably end up a bit listy. Uh, he was important, and so was this. Oh, but don't forget her, etc., etc. And Everdale fully hasn't hasn't fully escaped that here. It, it kind of reads like a, a list of not terribly well-integrated stories. Um, but if that really bothered me, I would never read this kind of book, and this happens to be a kind of book that I love very much, which is why I listed it in, what, in that video with the four others. I read this sort of stuff to learn about new connections between ideas that uh, I might have already known of, and um, I can hear I can handle that narrative jumpiness if the information is presented in an intelligent way. And Everdale is certainly the kind of uh, intellectual cicerone who's going to always teach you something fascinating. Uh, if you're interested in this time period of of intellectual history as a field, I would also recommend William M. Johnson's The Austrian Mind. An Intellectual and Social History, 1848 to 1938. Um, to be honest, it's as dry as hay and not nearly as, as fun to read as the first moderns, but his sense of curiosity and the, the sheer amount of information covered is uh, truly impressive in that book as it is in this one. Um, so if you're interested in that, it would complement what you find in here very nicely. A wonderful book, and once again, I thank Mihal for recommending it. The First Moderns by William R. Everdale.